So thank everyone uh, for joining us this morning for session 9D, which is the Warp Speed presentations. Um, my name is Lee Talbot. I am curator of textile museum collections at the George Washington University Museum and the Textile Museum in Washington, DC. And I'm also a board member of the Textile Society of America, and I'll be chairing this session today. So this session is unique at this symposium um, in that the talks follow what we call a warp speed format um, with presentations all set on a timer to last for 400 seconds. Um, most of the presentations will follow a 2020 format, um, which is 20 slides shown for 20 seconds each. Um, which is a presentation style developed in Japan. Um, it's often called Pechakucha. Um, this format allows for lively presentations on a variety of topics in a short period of time. Um, but of course, the timing is a challenge for the speakers, but that's part of the excitement of the Warp Speed session. Um, so we have seven speakers today, um, so let's go on and get started. So our first speaker today will be Barbara Call. Um, so Barbara, if you could... Um, yeah, so are you unmuted? Can I hear you? I am unmuted. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, awesome. so we're, we're ready to go. So I will give the introduction and then I will do a three, two, one countdown uh, and launch it. And once it goes to the first slide, um, of course, as you well know, but I'm telling for the audience, um, all the, the slides are set on a 20 second timer, um, which uh, the, the speaker has no control over, um, nor do I. Um, so, uh, so our, uh, Barbara is an assistant professor of theater arts at Hartwick College in Oneida, New York, where she teaches classes in costume and scenic design, theater history, stage makeup, and Asian theater. She's a mask maker um, who recently studied Commedia dell'arte acting and mask making in Florence, Italy. Her interests include sustainable theater practices and methods of natural dyeing. Um, she's the resident costume designer at Chenango River Theater, and in her spare time is a shepherd to a flock of 40 fin sheep. Um, so today, her, uh, her talk will be called Symbolism of Haudenosaunee, yes, Haudenosaunee Raised Beadwork. Okay, so um, three, two, one, here we go. So I'll briefly speak on Haudenosaunee beadwork uh, with the many closures of museums yeah. and native communities due to COVID-19. I couldn't do the type of research I intended. So this is very brief and an incomplete overview. The map shows the general location of the Haudenosaunee lands in New York state. Now, these are two pieces of Iroquois raised beadwork that I purchased. The heart on the left was created with purple velvet and red polished cotton on the back. The four colors of beads tell us that it's Mohawk in origin. The back of the trilobe pincushion cover is from the late 19th century and its state of decay actually allows us a look at the stitching process. Early Iroquois beading was flat and often had repeated symbols representing parts of the creation story, like the pouch on the left of the twins, who were the sons or grandsons of the goddess Sky Woman. Later beading often included more color and complex patterns and symbols like the strawberry, which was represented often as a heart. Now, the strawberry was a very important symbol. It was brought to earth by Sky Woman and along with tobacco was her medicine. It is the first fruit to bear in the spring and thus it begins the life cycle. It's an important symbol still that is used by modern bead artists, tying the past to the present. It's often represented by trilobe leaves or a berry in a heart shape. According to Iroquois bead artist, Karen Ann Hoffman and Oneida from Stevens Point, Wisconsin, the strawberry grows low to the ground, reminding us to remain humble. It also sends out runners, reminding us to reach out to others. It's no coincidence that strawberries were once called heart berries and are still represented as hearts on occasion. <clears throat> now birds and bird motifs are quite common in beadwork from the mid to late 19th century forward. Perhaps they represented the Carolina parakeet and reminded the Tuscarora of the birds from their Southern homeland before moving, moving from North Carolina to join the Iroquois Confederacy. Scholar Dolores Elliott believes that this is a recent myth, however. 
Nevertheless, there are thousands of pieces of raised beadwork with bird motifs, as well as beaded fabric birds like the ornament seen in this slide. These three-dimensional birds have been made since the 1890s and continue to be made today. According to Ms. Elliott, they make up only about 3% of the beadwork created, perhaps because of their complexity. Now here are two modern interpretations by artist Samuel Thomas on the left and Dolly Printup Winden on the right. The bird sitting on top of the tree of peace harkens back to the belief that the eagle is the protector of peace, alerting members of the Confederacy if danger approaches. This is one representation of the many stories about birds from Iroquois mythology. The late 19th century saw a rise in the tourist trade, excuse me, not late 19th century, all of the 19th century, uh, at Niagara Falls. And so many of the beaded bags sold there were sold by Haudenosaunee bead artists in a floral style. And looking at these examples, you can see the changes in the floral motif across time from the rounded fabrics to the more oblong shapes. <clears throat> Now here are two differing styles of Mohawk beadwork. The left has the red, blue, green, and yellow beads, which help distinguish many pieces of Mohawk origin. The trilobe seems to be based on the national arms of Canada, yet with American flags, perhaps indicating a bond between the United States and Canada. This may be the largest historic trilobe. Now this is an exceptional example of Tuscarora beadwork from around 1850 from the collection of Dolores Elliott. Over 100,000 beads adorn the purple velvet of this mask, which is approximately 17 and a half inches square and is the largest beaded mat ever documented, according to Ms. Elliott's research. These next two pieces are of Seneca origin. The beaded mat and beaded pincushion are an exquisite example of the height of the raised beadwork achieved by some artists. The pattern is created with clear seed beads and the addition of solid white seed beads as accents. Now, prior to 1700, glass beads were not actually sewn onto clothing. By the late 18th century, though, we see beaded regalia for both men and women. In this 1850 image of Caroline Parker, a Seneca woman from the Tonawanda Reservation, we can see beaded motifs of the celestial tree along her hem. It's not very different from the modern example next to it. In this Glen Gary cap from the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, we see the European influence from the Hudson Bay Company traders. This piece was beaded in the Niagara floral style that was so popular during the 19th century. Now, as we see in many collections, raised beading was not just for use as a tradable commodity to vacationing Victorian women. These examples in the Rockwell Museum collection show elaborate beadwork on clothing, footwear, and souvenirs as well. The pincushion on the right is the creation of a Tuscarora bead artist. Looking at the image from the 1870s of Tuscarora women selling their work along Niagara Falls, we see a piece in the foreground that looks extremely similar to the one from this recent Rockwell Museum exhibition. Could this be the creation of one of these two women? And why were these bags so popular with Victorian women? It has been postulated that this was a way to take home a bit of their exotic vacation. The patterns and colors all appealed to Victorian tastes, but regardless of the reason, the sales of beaded bags at Niagara Falls reached its height between 1890 and 1920. Haudenosaunee raised beadwork anchors the present with the past. In 2019, when McMaster University installed its 19th chancellor, Santee Smith, her ceremonial regalia had combined the traditions of the chancellor and her Mohawk and Scottish heritage in a robe with beaded cuffs, yoke, and Glengarry cap. Modern artists continue to create beautiful raised beadwork. Several of these masks were recently featured in First American Art magazine. Though different in its execution, we still see the strawberry as a major motif. The medicine plant mask by Marlena Thompson in the lower left of the screen was recently acquired by the Smithsonian American Art Museum. My thanks to everyone who shared their knowledge and their artwork and their photographs. Specific thanks go to Dolores Elliott, Jerry Byron, John Fadden, Karen Ann Hoffman, and the many bead artists who carry on the tradition of the past and create new forms for the future. Thank you.
All right, thank you very much, Barbara. Um, yeah, and I just want to point out that uh, the keynote lecture today, which will immediately follow uh, the warp speed presentation, um, the subject will be Haudenosaunee beadwork. So uh, I'm sure you'll all be interested to see this. Um, on another note, um, I forgot to say at the beginning, uh, please put your questions uh, in the Q&A, which you will see at the, uh, at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you want to just talk with each other, um, with other audience members, um, you can put that in chat. Um, but there are seven presentations today, so uh, you might want to type in the questions as you go along um, so that you don't forget anything. Um, so our next speaker is Julia O'Connell. So um, Julia O'Connell is an award-winning visual textile artist. Uh, she designed the coat for Godiva Awakes um, for the Cultural Olympiad London Olympics in 2012. Um, she was artist in residence at the Faculty of Engineering and Computing, Coventry University, and at the War Memorial Park in Coventry from 2014 to 15. Our recent work uh, includes being one of 100 artists commissioned for Processions 2018, a national artwork of handmade banners in London by Artichoke and 1418 Now, commemorating 100 years of women's votes. Recently, Julia's banner was chosen to be displayed for Helen Pankhurst's Deeds Not Words talk at the Birmingham Literature Festival in 2018. So today, Julia's uh, presentation is titled The Visible Maker. So uh, Julia, are you ready? Yep. Okay, so three, two, one, go. The Visible Maker was a project in which I explored digital tech in my practice uncovering stories, whether in the workplace or at home. It was a live performance where I stitched as well as performed a narrative about my family whilst using tech and a mechanical treadle sewing machine. My grandmother taught me to sew. I made a peg bag. She was an invisible mender for factories in England. She picked up dropped stitches in garments using her fingers and simple tools to repair. A mother of seven, she also did extra work at home getting pin money to support her children. I inherited her sewing machine. As part of a residency with Ludic Rooms here in Coventry, I built an early prototype where I connected the sewing machine to my computer and wrote some code. So when the treadle was rocked by my feet, the computer would release audio and video footage of my family's history. Engineer Nick Martin helped me overhaul the disused treadle machine. I kept the paint and oil spills, the scratches from its previous life. Nick told me that the scratch marks on the neck of the machine was caused by the cotton thread catching and are called witness marks. Once I remembered to turn the wheel towards me, muscle memory kicked in and my feet knew the rhythm of the treadle. I collected stories from family to create the narrative of the performance. Stories about sewing, but also how the machine's legs were a football goal mouth for my uncle's games. To create the performance, I worked with my husband, the playwright Chris O'Connell, and he acted as a script editor for my research. He encouraged me to use two things, my experience and my imagination. The most affecting theatre work must be authentic and honest. The story I wrote is universal, about family, domestic work and hidden stories. It was about the value of our every days and how insignificant moments are sometimes pivotal when recalled in future years. This is my grandmother's toolkit. It helped her fix thousands of socks and jumpers in the factories, meaning she could make a living and feed her family. My sewing kit began to change. It started to include more soldering wire than thread. Although the visible maker was daunting, as I'm also a theatre producer and work on many projects, I'm very familiar with process and learning to trust and test your instincts with new work. In the show, we used an LED light strip that was powered by the treadle and it would change the stage light's colour as I pedalled. Light change is a way in theatre to denote a step back into a different time or location in a play. 
Working with Ashley Brown, a technologist, we created lots of code. For example, once we got data from the sensor pad under the treadle, it could tell the computer, hey, the treadle has been pressed 20 times, so please reveal a memory sound or light change to add a different color into the performance. We used a breadboard. It's like a textile sampler of new stitches. It's kind of a way to test out your connections and code before you solder permanently. It was important that the new tech blended with the narrative and the performance of the show. Ash tested the FSR, which is a force sensitive resistor, which was padded and sat underneath the treadle machine. It's wafer thin, but can detect tiny amounts of pressure. This feeds into a microcontroller called an Arduino, which then tells the computer to release a sound, an image or a light change. This screen shows program timings and actions of the things I needed triggering. I set a time of 14 minutes during the show where an old photograph of my grandmother would gradually appear on the side of the sewing machine cover. A lot of my family were in a show one night and there was almost a whole row of people reaching for their hankies at the same point. Having contingencies was a paramount if something broke. A performance always has to continue in theatre so I had to learn to trust the new tech and my knowledge and also manage a mechanical sewing machine. The setup for the show was a replica of my artist studio. I left the computer visible on the table for the audiences so they could see the triggering effects when I treadled the machine. After each performance, I invited the audience to take a look round and I could demonstrate the tech. People also loved looking at the treadle machine too, as that also triggered, triggered lots of hidden and forgotten memories of textiles in their own families too. This machine is beautiful. It served a large working class family and enabled lots of piecework, providing money for housekeeping over the years. I'm proud that with new technology, I'm continuing its life. Whilst creating the set, it was strange how all my previous visual artwork seemed to have a place. It became almost a retrospective of my own textile adventures and stories. In a moment, you'll see me in performance. It's interesting to note that the red colour at the top of the set was powered by me treadling the, the mechanical machine, the plate at the bottom with my feet. I also put a random counter in the computer so every show would have a different audio and visual released each night. The machine worked like a dream every time and it still has the most perfect stitch. In my work, engaging and giving access to the arts is crucial. The machine was very poignant for the audience. There were lots of stories from others about sewing, work and family connections. Next for me is how I can build on this and share the experience wider. Can I make a machine that feeds in more textile stories from others and reveal other lives? The past is in my future. Don't all our futures need to understand past experiences? I look forward to more discoveries about the value of cloth and making in people's lives. Thank you for letting me share my project today. All right, so let me introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Roma Khan. Um, she is a multidisciplinary artist, educator, researcher, um, and is an assistant professor of the School of Visual Arts and Design, Beacon House National University in Pakistan, where she teaches in the Department of Textile, Fashion, and Accessory Design. Um, she's been actively engaged in community outreach initiatives rooted in craft revival and the empowerment of women. Her steered project uh, whom Nawa has won the McJanet Prize by Tufts University. Her interest in textiles spans across time from deep historical to contemporary e-textiles, proven by her selection by Les Moulins de Paillard, France, for their exclusive e-textiles program. She is on the founding team of Pakistan Design Foundation, 
uh, due to host inaugural Lahore Design Week in 2020. So today her talk is called A Walk Through Contemporary South Asian Textile Datsans. Did I pronounce that correctly? Dat That's Dat right. That's correct. Okay. Um, so I'll give you a, a countdown to three and then we will start. So three, two, one. Go. Thank you. So I will be sharing works of emerging textile artists from Pakistan who, have, who often have their practice rooted in a visual framework that the centuries old craft practices have provided. How these artists use these skeletal references to illustrate and de depict contemporary modern thought will be my focus. So, yeah, okay. So on the left here is a work of Mesun Hisham, who uses the visual framework of a Bengali kata to narrate her own fictitious story. This story is about an ignored cutlery set that has been put away by the lady of the house for its antiquated look. The forks and the spoons of the ignored set would creep out in the middle of the night and dance around. This work on the left now is by Huda Zahid, and it uses the compositional foundations of a Persian shikarga. And she's narrating the story of an accident with unconventional materials uh, through, through, these, through this. Um, moving forward, in both dimensionality and scale, this work by Kaina Khalifan narrates imagined experiences juxtaposed with reality creating each piece as a reflection upon personal association with the area and environmental cha challenges faced by the people of Damas, Gilgit, Baltistan. If you zoom in, the artist covers the craft that has been used in the area and she documents the remains of the silk trade route and uh, her ancestral crafts, flowers, leaves, bread loaves, mountain great horns, wolf paw prints, and this is an am amalgam of past and present installation uh, to, and a reminder for, of complexities, hardness and softness of this historical terrain. These fabric quilts by Zabe, unlike Tracy Emmons, illustrate the story of a girl who wants to hug her father every time she sees him. The father, a feudal lad, uh, landlord from the Balpur, and also a gaddi nasheen, which means he's a spiritual heir uh, to a Sufi tradition finds it odd to show affection to this girl child. It's not a cultural norm uh, here to hug girl, girl uh, child. She, said, she says it, it was different with her brothers. These life-size quilts show uh, scenes from her villages. Huda in, in her pieces here uh, illustrates the partition of 1947. This sets a backdrop for many stories that come from South Asia. You come across people who left a land where they were deeply rooted and had inha inhabited for decades, if not centuries, to cross the border and find refuge for their faith. Some left their stoves burning while others left their loved ones. And this larger backdrop of history, as we negotiate our current presence, provides an imagery of trains, barbed wires, vacant houses, and they become a motif for suffrage, pain, pain, migration, and loss. We use, we see the same works in, uh, here, uh, the same aesthetics in Nirmal's work here, who has hand embroidered cabinets of curiosities. Nirmal uh, illustrates the division that were of this once united linguistic and cultural region, while on the other side of the border, they, they have opened up a partition museum and in Pakistan, several other projects have been carried out to address this troubled history and its impact on the lived experience of people who, suffer, who, who migrated. This project came out of a series of interviews that she held with her grandfather, who was at the forefront of the independence movement. In the same spirit of finding inspiration in personal history, Eamon Gilani's work here is based on the Urdu language. She chooses a wooden tablet as a metaphor, which was traditionally used for education and embroiders it to question the future of language. Coming from a family of writers, this is a diachronic his, uh, history that she's captured. The, this travelogue made by Fatma Amjad with the help of local artisans zooms into the narrow alleys of villages you would pass by with the blink of an eye traveling from Lahore to Islamabad, the capital of Pakistan. 
the, de the detailed views open up vistas and cities for imagination and storytelling. Amna Hamid in these fabric prints are pa is painting small is is painting uh, the suppressed voices of women that ha that haven't been heard. While the world may have advanced, at least in the discourse of feminist politics, the Me Too movement left Pakistan extremely polarized. These textiles document the taboo societal uh, pressures and microaggressions that exist in the society. With visual underpinnings from Shiri Nishat's work, these fabric embroideries fulfill the promise and how contemporary culture can navigate the political and social realm. So Rafia Tahir here is an artist and a craft practitioner. She uses her craft of Fulkari. Fulkari is a composite term of Sanskrit, two Sanskrit words, uh, flower and to do, which means pool and, and uh, karya. And thus, uh, this means the work of flower. She has illustrated the, the story of 16th December, which is like Pakistan's 9-11. This work by Anam Khuram focuses on illustrating beauty in pain. Based on a traumatic childhood experience of studying in a madrasa, the installation comprises of quilted embroidered walls running text with a running text called Galti Atkan. Her teacher in madrasa would punish her by hitting her with a stick on her knuckles and maintained records uh, with by tearing paper and sticking it on a notebook with a certain coding. The work was a, trans, uh, was a performative installation with a sound piece that documented the hum or the rhythm of chanting holy verses. This piece by Fasi Salim, titled Embody, focuses on the interaction of textiles with body, movement, and space. The piece makes an artistic inquiry through knitted form into the notion of feminine beauty and its conventional association with the hourglass figure. The artifact in this exhibition subverts challenges and questions these assumptions. The aesthetic, the aesthetic language represents the absence and presence of body. And this work by Zulfakar Ali Bhutto is a part of series in which Islam is used, used as a vehicle to, pro, to propel the futurist imagination, looking into this occult practices, mysticism, and evolution of politicization. Zulfakar comments on the use of Islam as a third opinion that has evolved from a symbolic gesture of anti-imperialism. All right, thank you very much, Roma. Um, so questions for Rama, please put them in the Q&A at the bottom. Um, we will now move on to our fourth presenter, um, Gina Klein. So uh, Gina Klein uh, began working in fibers at age seven when she pillaged her mother's yarn and made 100 pom-poms, which she strung together and hauled around on a leash like a long limp pet snake. Her practice has since evolved and has now exhibited widely. Recent solo exhibition include Oz Arts in Nashville and Charleston Heights Art Center in Las Vegas. Recent group shows include Museum of Design Atlanta and Pulse Art Fair in Miami Beach. Um, she earned her BAD from North Carolina State University and MFA from Arizona State University. Klein is professor of fibers at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. And her talk today is called Craft and Community, Two Recent Projects. All right, so are you ready to go? Sure. All right, so three, two, one, go. I feel so lucky that my most egregious experience was that time at Lutheran Confirmation Camp when I was 12 and the counselor slid his hand up my leg. It was basically all skin that was exposed anyway. So does that even count? On October 16th, 2017, I joined the chorus of women posting Me Too on social media after first asking myself whether or not my own experiences counted for not really being serious enough. This thought process was, of course, ridiculous. Women are so routinely subjected to harassment and assault that has become normalized. When I diminish the significance of my own experiences, I perpetuate the myth in society that women do not have autonomous bodies 
and I contribute to the much more violent assaults that so many women have survived or not. In this project, made during a residency at Art Space in Raleigh, North Carolina, I constructed a pile of soft sculptures of the phrase, me too. All of the fabric, both for the exteriors and the interior stuffing, was donated by my late grandmother's church quilting group. I selected stereotypically hyper-feminine prints and colors with bodily references, blood, teeth, skin, and bone. Through the month of the residency, visitors to my open studio helped stuff the sculptures and the Me Too's piled up on the floor. As I cut and stitched and stuffed and chatted, I became angrier and angrier. I reflected on every gendered violation of my body and my psyche, from dress codes designed to reinforce girls' responsibility over boys' behaviors, to the sexualized Halloween costumes marketed to my young daughter, to a president who bragged about sexual assault and still got elected. Writing a concise artist statement about the project became an impossible task. And so I unleashed my anger on the wall and I, and I invited others to do so too. I tethered markers to cut strips of fabric suspended from the ceiling. And spontaneous choreography erupted in the space as women maneuvered fluidly around each other and knelt on heaps of Me Too's to scrawl their own fury. There were notations of solidarity and support and also commiseration and confirmation. Strangers became friends. There was hugging. And then toward the end of the evening, a man walked into the space, stared at the wall, shouted that women deserve everything they get and stormed out. I have no ownership of the phrase, me too. And so, as the exhibition concluded, I gave away every sculpture to anyone with whom the phrase resonated. I miss President Obama. I miss everything about him. I miss him with the kind of passion usually reserved for first celebrity crushes in adolescence. I miss his smile. I miss his intellect. I miss his genuine love for his family. I miss how the biggest scandal when he was in the White House was that one time he wore a tan suit. And I'm certainly not the only one who feels this way. Over several months in 2019, I crowdsourced via social media the infinite qualities we collectively miss about President Obama. Kindness, calmness, caring, smart, respectful and respected, of dignity and high character, humility, empathy, and quick wit, classy, compassionate, and hardworking. I processed my own mourning over his absence from the White House as I hunted and pecked each of these statements on an old fashioned typewriter. I then manipulated the words in Photoshop and sent off the digital images to Spoonflower to be printed on fabric before lining and stitching and stuffing, again with my late grandmother's church quilting group scraps, these soft sculptures in my studio. These two sided pieces that most people interpret as pillows, which is fine, are love letters of loss. One side is the simple salutation, Dear President Obama, while the other side continues the content. I miss your sense of humor. I miss your common sense and decency. I miss your class and eloquence. I miss your empathy. I miss your voice. I miss your Supreme Court nominees. My goal for this project was to enclose these heaps of sculptures in a large upholstered box in which anyone could climb in and wallow like an adult sized ball pit of sorrow. That ultra ultimate dream has not come to fruition though. 
and this literally immersive art experience is not likely to be exhibited in its ideal physical form anytime soon in this ongoing time of isolation. The one and only public appearance for this unfinished work was in the Appalachian State University Art Department faculty exhibition in early March 2020. Students willingly flung themselves into the heap of hearts at the opening reception, which also became the closing reception as the specter of COVID-19 swept into campus. These sacks of sculptures are now mired in the purgatory of my studio with no real hope of escape. As much as I want to send this work back out into the world and reclaim a big swath of studio floor space, I'm actually fervently wishing for it to become basically irrelevant. I am hoping desperately that the kindness, compassion, and humanity that I so deeply miss about President Obama will soon be restored to the White House and that this project will slip into a space of sweet nostalgia with no real bearing on the present. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so it's a powerful presentation. So now we're moving on to our next uh, speaker. So Stephanie Sabo is an artist, designer, and educator uh, living in Los Angeles. Her research and design discourse often investigates the line dividing art from design, particularly where stylistic choices are used to demarcate social status. Recently, she published her article, Conflict Zones, in the Journal of Textile Design, Research, and Practice, and exhibited her work, The Shapes We Live With, in at Los Angeles Municipal Art Gallery. She received her MFA from CalArts and currently teaches at USC and Otis College of Art and Design. Today, her um, presentation is titled Reclaimed, Evelyn Roth. All right, so Stephanie, are you ready to go? All right, so three, two, one, go. Today, as I'll be discussing the work of artist Evelyn Roth, my purpose is to establish her significance alongside other artists who have received greater recognition for their historical contributions. I first encountered her work as part of the exhibition, Hippie Modernism, The Struggle for Utopia, organized by the Walker Art Center with subsequent showings at the Cranbrook Art Museum and the UC Berkeley Art Museum. Roth's environment for reading, recycled from 110 sweaters, immediately brought to mind the piece Faith Wilding made for the CalArts Feminist Art Program's exhibition, Women House. Wilding's work, known first as Womb Room and later as Crocheted Environment, was made two years before Roth's, but disappeared shortly after the show opened and was not reconstructed until 1995. It's impossible to know whether Roth knew about Wilding's work before making her environment, but we can see how the piece is a continuation of ideas Roth had already been exploring prior to 1972. More on that in a moment. And the fact that she carefully handcrafted it by unraveling so many discarded sweaters and re-knitting the yarn with large needles she made from driftwood ties the piece to environmental concerns in addition to exploring ideas about feminism and women's labor. The same year, Roth made the 14 by 18 family sweater, also by re-knitting discarded garments. She explains, quote, the idea is that an ordinary family of four can live most of their everyday life in this sweater, which keeps you warm, so you don't have to have any heat on in your house, and it conserves energy. I have to admit, this experiment in familial bonding or confinement sounded more fun before quarantine. But it does show just how driven Roth was to engage in participatory practice. She created projects, but they were always about fostering interaction with others. In her car cozy project created three years earlier, she blanketed her station wagon with this homemade knitwear throughout the long trip from Vancouver to Nova Scotia. She stopped in many cities to acquire additional videotape from TV stations and to hold workshops teaching participants her crochet technique with the material. There's also a media critique embedded in her work. 
Marshall McLuhan published The Media is the Massage in 1967, and artists were exploring the effect of mass communications on society. Ant Farm staged their well-known media burn in 1975, and Namjoon Pike began his TV Buddha series in 1974. Here, Roth is demonstrating how to wear and use her piece, TV Trap, created in 1972. The video tape she used to create the solitary tunnel between viewer and object would have otherwise been discarded as its usefulness diminishes after the 300th time it's been recorded over. Her crocheted videotape works are her most iconic and recognizable pieces. She used this flexible, thermal insulating and abundantly available material to create an awning for the Vancouver Art Gallery and a shade canopy for the British Columbia Pavilion at Expo 74. The outfit she wore, she refers to as video armor. Her work also shows us how to have fun and create fun for others. Um, in here, this, in the next slide, she, um, she's made outfits for a roller derby event and a web playground for children, made way before yarn bombing was a thing. She calls her pieces moving sculptures. And in 1976, she founded a company like a dance company, except for choreographed sculptural performances. Regarding her prioritization of this dynamic experience over the lifeless object left over, she said, quote, a lot of artists do not have products to sell. I have a few sculptural pieces that I could sell, but I'm always using them and I'd rather keep them and use them in a performance, in an event. One, as an artist, should always be growing and use social conditions, the new events in the city, the materials, the space, all this into account to plan a project, end quote. Participants would work out a sensitivity to each other through movement while experiencing the warmth and security of the costume-like covering. Many of her ideas about happenings and the generative creativity of being in the moment were nurtured in the artist collective Intermedia, which she joined in 1961. The group expanded the definition of art as it had been understood in Vancouver and helped to put social practice on the map. Roth was particularly focused on increasing sensitivity, now we might call it empathy. She wanted her work to increase participants' sensitivities to each other, to the environment, and even the tactile qualities of the materials involved. People have lost certain, she would say, people have lost a sensitivity to certain fibers, mainly because we're so used to wearing synthetics. How does it feel to have leather on? How does it feel to wear fur, to wear feathers? We can see how the experiments she undertook, whether or not they were widely known, contributed in significant ways to important developments in art. Her embrace of trash and cast-offs as potential art materials, and her playful, wearable, performance-oriented, highly crafted objects opened possibilities for many other artists working today. And now that the long-predicted global apocalypse has officially begun, Evelyn Roth shows us a way to move forward in the world with sincerity, openness, sensitivity, and a keen eye for using what's already here and headed for the trash heap. As other artists of her generation already warned us back in the 70s, we are picking up the pieces of the wreckage of civilization in order to find whatever is useful to build what comes next. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, so now um, uh, we're already at our last uh, presenter today. Um, number seven is Kartika Odine. So I'll introduce you, Kartika, but I'm going to have to get your help with one French pronunciation, OK? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, textile designer Kartika Odine has more than 25 years of experience with a background 
in designing luxury furnishings with products sold worldwide. Currently, she is creative director at St. Coletta of Greater Washington, an adjunct professor at Montgomery College. She has taught at the Corcoran College of Art and Design at the George Washington University for eight years and publishes, lectures, and conducts regular workshops on textiles. She holds two MAs in textile design from the National Institute of Design, India, and the, um, this is where I need your help. École Nationale de Création, uh, de Industrielle de Création Supérieure. All right, thank you very much. And so her interests include cultural heritage, sustainable development through craft, textile design, and education. So today, Kartika's talk is called High-End Textiles and Other Crafts for and by Adults with Disabilities at Coletta Collections, a social enterprise. All right, so I'll give you a countdown. Um, three, two, one, let's go. Hi, everybody. As Lee just told you, I'm a textile designer and professor and the creative director at Coletta Collections, a social enterprise. We design and handcraft high-end textiles, glass tableware, and jewelry with adults with a wide range of significant disabilities, physical and intellectual. And this is an introduction to their story. I shall focus on our textiles today. This is the weaving studio at Coletta Collections. On a typical day, you hear the rhythm of wooden harnesses creaking up and down, beaters thudding, patient voices of instructors, laughter, or a sudden scream. Just another manner of expression. <clears throat> Everyone is learning and creating at their own pace earning wages and feeling a sense of purpose and inclusion. Ruth began weaving about 12 years ago and is now capable of warping and setting up her looms with limited help. She can weave tightly woven tote bag fabrics on high, on large heavy looms or modulate her beating for delicate scarves. With her seemingly quiet personality, comes a surprising natural flair at modeling. See her video at colettacollections.com. Others like Celeste are relatively new to weaving. Eager to succeed, initially she would bulldoze through mistakes hoping nobody would notice. As Celeste responds well to positive reinforcement, we praised her when she paid closer attention to quality. Today, she manages multiple parts of a project, undoing weaving errors, measuring her fabric, and swapping the colors on her shuttles. Marie's drive is unlike any other artisan, with an incredible ability to work on as many as three different projects in a single day. A perfectionist, she can also have bouts of anxiety and meltdowns. So to strike the right balance, we adapt and structure projects for her with detailed treadling and wefting patterns, numbered shuttles, and measurement cards. Prone to seizures, Nadia has a one-on-one -on -one dedicated caretaker who is at arm's reach at all times. Despite this lack of freedom, being obliged to wear a helmet and weave on a small loom because of her small size, it's a table loom, Nadia is our little Miss Sunshine. Always happy and chatty, she takes great pride in her work, in getting paid, being a weaver and part of the team. We constantly find solutions to get around physical challenges. Artistically inclined, when Hassan expressed a desire to weave, we rigged up a contraption with a magnet and a strap to pass the shuttle through the shed, while another person operated the treadles. But when we found that this was physically taxing for him, we proposed printing with lightweight blocks with the assistance of staff, equally satisfying. Notoriously difficult with what we call behaviors, bored with most activities, one day Phoebe agreed to sit with me at a floor loom. Something clicked and she began to weave, just like that. Super smart. In a few months, Phoebe graduated to production quality, manipulating up to three shuttles and treadling up to eight pedals. 
he still has violent attention-seeking outbursts, but less. Mr. X, as I'm going to call him, has been with the program since childhood and has become a capable staff member. One of our biggest success stories, he wishes to remain strictly private. Highly talented, he is eager to perfect new textile techniques despite his secret difficulties with counting. Apart from weaving, he has perfected kumihimo, crochet, and complex jewelry making. <clears throat> Although textiles is important, it is not the answer to all our artisans' needs. Some lack the attention span, others may be allergic to certain materials, and yet others cannot cope with performance anxiety. However, the principles of providing them with professional design, high quality materials, adapted tools, and staff support can be translated across a range of crafts <clears throat> and skills. What makes the Coletta Collections program unique is the process of designing our products. <clears throat> it's done as if in the industry. Twice a year, I guide our design team, a core group of talented staff in interpreting trend boards to come up with approximately 50 new prototypes. Our artisans chip in with suggestions while making several rounds of prototypes, refining the product. What I have shown you is the result of intensive work since 2011, when I joined the organization. Thanks to the vision of the leadership, we modernized, purchased equipment, and never scrimp on training or photography. From day one, we agreed that our products should stand for themselves, anchored on design, quality, and innovation. Naturally, we prioritized limited editions. Marie, Celeste, and Ruth have been co-workers for a long time. Most of our artisans enjoy working together, spending breaks together, and admiring each other's work. Some confide in me, and I get to know of daily frustrations, a bewildered mind transitioning from home to group home, a sweet love affair, or a quirky sense of humor. Through COVID-19, we have kept in touch with our artisans. Handcrafting high-end products not only combines therapeutic and financial benefits, the Coletta Collection Studios are a space where our artisans feel a sense of community, perform tasks that bring value and dignity, hone their talents, and increase self-confidence. We are eagerly waiting to get back to our studios. I thank the well-wishers who support our work and everybody at Coletta Collections. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kartika. Um, so uh, we've made it through our seven um, uh, our uh, seven presentations, and so um, now we have a uh, uh, questions here. I don't think that the panelists can see the questions, so um, I will be reading them out. Um, so the first question is for Barbara. Um, so, Barbara, can you tell us um, what was historically the source of the beads? In my research, there was Venetian glass and glass from Eastern Europe that was brought to what is now the United States and Canada through trade. In the New York State Museum, they have examples of very, very early beads that were made from clay and stone and shell and decorations also happened with porcupine quills, but the glass beads were European. All right, thank you. Um, so a question for uh, Gina. Um, it's an interesting question. Has President Obama seen your work? <laughs> um, not that I know of, but if anyone has any connections, just let me know and uh, <laughs> love to send it his way. Yes, that's right. Okay, thank you. Um, so just in the comments, it's not a question, but just to say, Gina, brilliant. Okay. Um, another question for you, Gina. Um, it said, oh, well, it's, it's just a comment. It says, I literally clapped out loud at the end, at the conclusion of your presentation in solidarity. Um, that comes from Robin. So this is a question for uh, Roma. Um, 
Well, it's more of a uh, it's more of a statement. It says, Roma, I would love to see this work in a museum show in the U.S. It deserves a larger treatment. Um, so can you comment on uh, if there is some uh, plans for international travel <laughs> for any of this work? Um, so we have, uh, we've been really trying to do this, but again, like I said, there is, so, so there are limited pla platforms here, um, and, and, um, the cultural, uh, industry in Pakistan is not as kind of, you know, refined. So we've been, I mean, we, uh, yesterday also we were in a discussion and there were some artisans from India and there were talks of how these artisans can come out and share. Uh, their knowledge with a wider audience, and um, and and the same kind of uh, you know comment uh, grew out of that that uh, there is a will and desire and talent, and there is all of that, but there are not enough opportunities, um, and um, so so we need support for that. Um, but but of course there is the, for for us to be kind of shown uh, is. Uh, is, is the dream uh, of all artists to be shown as much as they can be. Uh, Zulfikar, uh, the, the artist I, I mentioned at the end, um, he uh, is showing internationally quite a lot because he's himself, uh, you know, he has the, uh, the privilege or the power to do so. He is the grandson of uh, Pakistan's uh, biggest pol political party. And uh, so he's, he has you know, the, the revenues to do so also. Um, but then there is a lot of talent and I often think, you know, this is something that I think about when I go. So I am also somebody who's uh, quote unquote privileged in the sense that I can travel. And when I go, uh, when, I, when I travel, I see that there is a lot of similarity in the kind of concerns and works and politics uh, of identity um, that, that these uh, artists have over here uh, compared to all over the world. Yet, I feel that uh, the, the dialogue, there needs to be more, more of that dialogue and they need to come together more often and we need, we need more platforms. And, I, and especially about textiles, I feel like textiles are something that really can connect uh, people together and should connect people together because we're already in, in, in a way in a, some kind of a hierarchy, right? So we need to, we need to the, the activism that this uh, group or this cohort needs to develop, uh, needs to be stronger. Um, so yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, so we might look forward to seeing some um, if we're lucky as we go forward. Thank you. Um, let's see, so more questions coming in. Um, let's see. So uh, again, for Stephanie, um, let's see, Stephanie. Do you have any resources you would recommend for looking more into Evelyn Roth's work? She has a book that came out in 1975, but other than that, I haven't seen any kind of like monographs or anything published about her work. Um, from my research, I think the, the, the institution that has the most kind of comprehensive um, knowledge of her work so far is the Vancouver Art Gallery. Um, she lived in Vancouver for a long time, although now she lives in Australia. And it seems like they try to reg show her work on a more of a regular basis. But again, she, um, not a lot of her work exists as kind of like objects unto themselves um, because so many of them were constantly used in performances. Um, so I do think that there's like kind of a maybe some some lack of, of, of archival um, knowledge and and resources for her work. But she's still she's she's 80, I think she turns she turns 84 in December and she's still making art and she's still doing things all the time. And one of the things that she does on a regular basis is she creates these kind of um, programs based on these nylon inflatables that she's been making for years and years. And they're fantastic, they're amazing. I didn't have time in the presentation to talk about all of the work that she's done since. I, I think I ended with a project that she did in like 1982. But um, 
there's so much that she's contributed since then and continues to do so. She's a real inspiration. Okay. Yeah, well, a lot of Vancouver denizens are very happy to see you present on this today. You might have seen in the chat. Congratulations from, uh, from some of our friends in, in Vancouver. Um, let's see. We have another question for uh, Barbara. Um, so, Barbara, uh, what were the precedents and reasons for the huge interest and in adaptation of beating by Native Americans? Oh boy, um, <laughs> I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm the person you really want to ask that question of because boy, um, not an anthropologist. Um, uh, uh, my, my best guess from what I have, I mean, almost every um, indigenous culture pretty much worldwide has ornamentation on their clothing. And even if you're not of an indigenous nature, if you're like a mutt like me, you know, you like pretty things. So um, I think with the beading specifically, because again, across the United States, different, um, different Indian cultures have beading on their work, just not the raised beading that the Haudenosaunee developed. Um, but I think it's just access to the glass beads was part of what gave rise to, you know, the beading in that style. And then the dissemination of that beadwork came, it was, it was a tradable commodity. It was something that was then later sold. And the women could make money for their families because particularly in the 19th century, um, Niagara Falls became the destination. That was the place you went. It was this beautiful, exotic, gorgeous place. And the, the Haudenosaunee women uh, particularly the Tuscarora were given permission to sell along the shores of the Niagara Rapids because it was private land at that point. And um, it was, it was an opportunity and being savvy businesswomen, they took it. Um, but in general terms of beating overall, I'm, I'm not the person to answer that. I'm, I apologize, but that's, that's not my, my area. However, Jolene and her plenary may be able to give more, more insight. So stick around for the next session. That's right. That's right. So the, the, the plenary session will start at 1215 Eastern time. Um, and uh, so we will hear, hear directly about, uh, from uh, an artist. So maybe she'll touch on the, the origins of, of that. We, we will see. Um, all right. Uh, so for Kartika, um, so Kartika says, great presentation and terrific organization. How did the craft collection get started? So can you tell us something about the origin of Coletta? That's, that's okay. a long story, but I'll try to uh, give a concise answer. Uh, so when I joined uh, St. Coletta of Greater Washington in 2011, just like most programs for adults with disabilities, they had some amount of, uh, you know, um, what we can call artistic uh, activities. But it was, and so, so this, the, there were, you know, uh, people who already had some skills. So that's where the person I spoke about uh, right in the beginning, Ruth, for example, she was already with the program. Uh, so there were some people who already had a certain amount of skills. There were others who uh, absolutely had no skills. So what I started off by doing was really trying to give the whole program some kind of a coherence, a coherent collection coherence in terms of the, the way our products would look so that there was some amount of, you know, something like branding uh, from the industry. So this has really been an exercise in combining luxury industry and uh, craft, almost like cottage industry, right? Uh, and then I set up various workshops. So I started off by setting up a workshop in Maryland in Rockville, where there was absolutely nothing. And we started by uh, training. I started by training the trainers and got them to learn how to weave. And we set up a weaving studio. 
Uh, meanwhile, there was a weaving studio in Virginia where Ruth was working, where there were several high functioning um, adults who were already weaving. So there, what I tried to do was really improve the quality. So we, you know, cleaned out all of the, we had a lot of people give a lot of donations. <laughs> so we cleaned out everything, got really good quality materials, and then little by little gave it a uh, you know, shape. So uh, we programmed the uh, collection in such a way that we would uh, work on textiles. We chose products that we wanted to develop. We test marketed them. So very much like in the industry, once you know, these studios began to grow, we started making prototypes. We test marketed them. We found that we had great reaction and uh, then it just kind of grew. Uh, from uh, just uh, two, two to three studios, we have grown to eight studios where we do textiles, glass, beading, and glass jewelry, as well as, you know, in, in, within textiles, we do weaving, tie-dye, uh, lots of block printing, painting, and crochet. That's right. Yeah. Well, you're a busy person because you also have a full teaching schedule, too, and even Yes, I, with, through our museum, GW, uh, lots of different organizations. So DC area, we really um, lean heavily on you and your weaving skills and your teaching skills. Yeah. Thank you, Dee. Um, so uh, a question for Gina. Um, this comes from Pat Hickman. Um, so Gina, um, did the Lutheran quilting group of your grandmother's church participate out of their sense of shared responsibility for what happened to you? and the Lutheran Conference camp, which led to your project? Uh, <clears throat> so, no. So they actually have been giving me fabric uh, for probably 20 years. Um, so I've, I've worked really exclusively with donated fabric from that church quilting group in my studio for, for decades. Um, and really, I mean, that, that project and that title is kind of just a snippet of it. I mean, I feel like that was just my experience to share, but really, I think feel like the project was not ultimately about what I, in my mind, identified as like my worst experience. Um, so, yeah. well, okay. thank you for that question. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, let's see. So, a question uh, for Julia. So Julia, is there anywhere where we can see um, videos of your performance? Um, there's a documentary being made currently about the work. And um, so that will be put together of the experience. And also I've got even um, in that, I've got my research part, which shows me receiving the treadle sewing machine and starting to unpack it and get it to a state of use um so that's kind of like being sorted and um i'm hoping to be able to tour the work post covid because i think it's a great way of opening up conversations about hidden stories and our lives so that's kind of like the next element of the work for me is is can i manipulate the machine as well so that i could feature other people's stories and recollections and then create a code that in performance can emit some of these other people's stories live as well. So, mm -hmm. yes, so still ongoing and the video is coming soon. <laughs> good, good, we'll look out for that. Um, I was just curious about the time commitment. I mean, that must have been just an enormous, uh, taken an enormous amount of time to set, set that up. Can you give us some idea of, the, of, of how that, the timeline? Yes, um, I think um, from, uh, idea to prototype to realization it took about uh, a year and a half because you have to remember that I'm a stitcher first and foremost and as well as doing the research and collecting the stories I had to learn a process and a language about um, interactive technology and also how I could immerse that in my practice without it just being a tricksy kind of tech um, you know um, you know there is that analog digital conversation that's going on and um, so I took my time with it because I also had to write a script and prepare a performance. 
So there was various stages, but as I said before, I'm also a theatre producer and I run a theatre here in England. So I'm able to do the, you know, the, the project element. I think the scary thing is I trained originally as an actor and going back into performance um, was, was with and stitching live to make another peg bag and hoping that all the tech work, that was really scary. But like I said in my presentation, the actual machine stitched like a dream every night and people were very connected to this very familiar treadle sewing machine that they'd seen back, you know, in their own lives. And for young people, they loved to see a, ma a mechanical machine. So yeah, so about a year and a half altogether, so. Okay, yeah. So where is the, the theater? Is it in, in Coventry? Yes, it is. Yes, we, um, it used to, um, it was a, we took over a, 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 an old fashioned chip shop cafe and we turned it into kind of like a, an off Broadway kind of space. It's uh, like a black box and it has about 60 seats and we have theatre labs and uh, we run writing uh, support work for artists. Uh, so it's a professional space. Uh, people, uh, writers are commissioned all over the country to come and perform. But at the moment we just have it open for solo artists. And the idea is we work across disciplines. So for me as a textile artist, but also I work with dancers and we kind of explore our crafts together, so. All right, thank you. Um, so for Gina, we have a follow-up question. Um, and this says, uh, has the Lutheran uh, quilting group seen your works? Have you gotten any feedback from them? Um, so they have seen a lot of my earlier work. Um, I don't know that they've seen my work of the last few years. Um, I, I also make quilts and so I will, I will visit them sometimes when I, um, am in, in town where they live and we'll show them quilts and, you know, hang out a little bit. And I know that anytime my work is anywhere within about an hour's drive of where the quilting group is, they'll like go on little pilgrimages together, which is really, really sweet. Um, I, I have to say, honestly, I've been a little bit hesitant to, um, to show them my most recent, more political work. I, I, I think that a lot of them would respond really well to it, but some of them might not be quite so favorable to it. Yeah. And I would hate to um, slow down the flow of fabric. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, thank you. So another question for Karthika. Um, how did you transition from textile design to special needs design and instruction? And uh, how does this transition from design to service challenge textile history? Okay, uh, let me try to explain the first question. Um, I um, was parachuted into uh, Coletta collections. <laughs> and I still remember when I first uh, walked in, um, the caretakers over there, you know, told me, oh, be aware of this one and be aware of that one. He gets violent or she gets violent. So, you know, it's, it's uh, as I said, we work with a, a, a set of adults with a wide range of disabilities and many of them feel a sense of frustration and um, you know uh, they can only express themselves in certain ways and sometimes that can be violent but I think that it's my upbringing I was born and brought up in India and we have a um, I don't know, you know, a genuine concern for um, people who are um, having difficulties in, in, in whichever realm of life, uh, you know, in the family. We, we are very, um, uh, what can I say, pro-social work, uh, right from my grand, great-grandmother onwards. And so I think it kind of, you know, it's something that I always have. And I know that many of my students, many of the people I work with, have always told me about my uh, ability to be empathetic. So I think that, you know, um, that aspect is something that just uh, uh, is something that I uh, uh, just use. Um, so as far as textiles uh, is concerned, I would um, 
suggest to participants to you know uh, work with me and as i said like phoebe very often uh, the caretakers would all roll their eyes at me and say oh my goodness what is she doing now but uh, you know i would invite uh, participants to come sit with me and uh, well, sometimes they can be a little violent and you get a bit of a shock, but uh, otherwise, most of the time, they're very happy to be acknowledged and they're very happy to learn something new. And uh, so that is uh, one of the, uh, that was how, you know, uh, I managed to bridge um, my textile design capacities as well as working with adults with disabilities and i think that uh, the uh, in terms of uh, the second question was about textile history uh, um, yes how does this transition from design to service challenge textile history yes so um you know when i left india i always thought i left india when i was 24 and until then i was very much um, uh, uh, taken up by the idea of working for a nonprofit organization. I was always somebody who was attracted to that. And I always grew up with uh, cottage industries around me. In India, we have cottage industries all around, you know. And so when I left India, that was something that I missed. And um, here was an opportunity to actually uh, question what tradition is and can we create tradition and can we create cottage industry uh, it's just that the participants are adults with disabilities but the rest is all very much in the same line of uh, working with our hands working uh, on a small scale and yet trying to produce really good quality so um, I hope that this will continue and uh, will actually become textile tradition and some, somewhere along the line, history. Yeah. All right, thank you. I um, have another question <clears throat> for Barbara. Um, Barbara, do you know in what ways were our strawberries used as medicine? Um, I know that in I can't speak specifically to the Haudenosaunee, um, but they, I know they are diuretic, the leaves are diuretics in just in herbal medicines. Um, and apparently they do help promote liver function. Uh, when it comes to learning about things specifically um, related to um, a native group, I was somewhat stymied because of COVID-19. And one woman, um, Karen Ann Hoffman, who um, I referenced in my, my presentation, said that really trying to learn something over electronic, she would not, she wouldn't um, talk about things, teach over an electronic device because she said, you need to learn this at the knee of an elder. So you need to have face-to-face, heart-to-heart context. You know, you need to be talking to someone directly. So there's no misunderstandings and so on. So I would not deign to speak of that because it is not my culture. I am an outsider looking in and admiring it. But again, um, Jolene may be able to offer more information or once this pandemic quells itself um, and the native communities are open to visitors or the, the museums that um, display native artwork and such, that may be a place to go and ask questions like that directly, but I would not presume. All I know is just sort of my own, you know, just traditional medicine in the United States that, you know, people have used herbal medicines, but specifically for um, Native purposes, I don't want to overstep. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Karthika, um, are the participants, uh, the artists with disabilities compensated for their work? Um, and if so, how do you determine your compensation? Yes, the, the participants are paid for their work. We pay them the uh, minimum wage determined by each state. And we operate in three states, Washington DC, Virginia, and Maryland. And so whatever the minimum wage is established by the state is what is paid 
so they get hourly wages. It's a very complex uh, problem because if they earn too much, then they will stop getting social security. So that's a it's, it's a it's a long story. But uh, just to answer the question, yes, we do pay our participants, our artisans. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll we'll finish with um, a suggestion um, from uh, Renee Herlong, and she said that it would be nice to hear about hopes <clears throat> hopes for the future from each panelist. So I think that's a great way to end. So I'll give you a couple of minutes, <clears throat> seconds. Think about what are your hopes um, for the future. It may be related to the subject of your talk, or it may just be more um, uh, more universal. Um, so I'm just going to go in order of how I see you on my screen. Um, and so Kartika, why don't you go ahead? All right. Well, this ties into one of the questions that I answered just before about, uh, you know, services and textile history. And so my hope is that uh, textile, we, that we, we textile designers find meaning uh, in these kinds of efforts and that more and more programs for adults with disabilities embrace such approaches where we are not just providing them with activities, but we are also providing them with an activity that brings a lot of value to their work and, uh, you know, of course, earnings as well. Yeah, that's my hope. All right. Thank you very much. So next on my screen is Julia. So Julia, could you comment on some of your hopes for the future? Um, my hopes is that soon we'll be able to return to actually being able to physically connect and stitch with each other. I've missed that so much, the touch of cloth and connecting with each other. Um, and in the next year, I want to explore haptic technology for those people who can't actually access a physical space and how to represent touch on screen. So that's kind of like what I'm, my ambitions are. And also understanding that I might not be a writer, but the power of my making is in my stitch. All right, thank you very much. So uh, next, um, Gina. Um, I, I really do hope that my recent work becomes totally irrelevant, like just a relic of the past kind of, you know, like almost like a time capsule of now that then we can look back on and be glad we are past. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Stephanie. As you can probably tell from the end of my presentation, things have been feeling fairly hopeless in California with especially um, being so up close and personal to all the fires. Um, it just gives, we have a front row seat on climate change um, and we, also can consider the fact that the pandemic is also a product of climate change in a sense. Um, it's a product of um, creeping into areas that used to be wild areas in order to advance factory farming. That's most of the ways that um, pathogens jump from one species to the next. Um, and the prediction is that that will increase over the future. So I derive hope from, I don't know, there was a, a great op-ed that came out in the New York Times this summer about being hope free so that we don't have to cling to hope anymore, um, almost in the kind of like Buddhist sense that we can kind of like let go of our need for hope um, and just recognize that we can be kind of actively engaged in a joyful practice of salvaging and reclaiming. All right, thank you. Uh, so uh, Barbara. Selfishly, my, my hope for the future is that sooner rather than later, we're able to open our theaters again because a theater practitioner with closed theaters is a very lonely person. Um, our, our work is about groups and collaboration and interaction with an audience and quite frankly it's been a really difficult year not just for me but I mean for New York certainly I mean Broadway's closed until the middle of next year and we miss it I mean there's a reason why Netflix and all of those streaming companies are doing great business because we need that escapism but there's something a little more special about it when 
it's it's in person and you feel the energy coming back live so my hope is that we get back to the theater sooner rather than later safely thanks thank you um so michaela how about you what are your hopes for the future um i guess i'll speak to um in line with my paper the issue of maybe cultural appropriation in the fashion industry specifically um and i guess I hope that moving forward, you know, as we research uh, historic designers and work that already exists, or as designers produce new work, that um, perhaps there can be greater transparency and information sharing about, you know, people's references and the cultures that they are referencing, and that there's less kind of um, reducing cultural artifacts to decoration, um, you know, without context. Okay, very good, thank you. And so lastly, we'll finish with Roma, who is uh, the furthest away in distance in Pakistan. Um, so if you could tell us what are your hopes for the future, Roma? Yeah, so I think I would, I would uh, hope for this distance to somehow, uh, at least uh, in, in, in other ways, I mean, the physical distance will remain, but. Uh, we could connect in better ways and and that could be with having more platforms in pakistan to be uh, to could to kind of have more agency uh, in textile as a medium i think that is something that i've been really uh, hoping for it is a very potent medium for but using that medium to kind of connect and uh, bring a tech make a textile world like we have the art world i think that is what i really hope for um, and that textile world be as powerful as as the art world um, and then yeah I just I think we need more planetary alliances and um, we need more scholarship at least in, in in our region to to make those planetary alliances possible so yeah that's what I hope for all right thank you very much so I just want to give a very special thank you to all seven of our panelists um, this is the second uh, warp speed presentation. I know that it presents a special challenge. Um, not all of the, uh, if you chose to present in another type of panel, you wouldn't have that, that nerve wracking um, timer going. And I was just so happy to have such a, such a diversity of topics. Um, that's one of the great things about the, uh, the warp speed presentation.